Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ethics in Psychedelic Therapy and Research. We are going to pause for a moment to let Zoom load all of the attendees. All right, hello and welcome to Ethics in Psychedelic Therapy and Research. I am Carmel Schachar, the Executive Director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. I am delighted to welcome you to this event. This is one of the events associated with POPLAR, which is the Project on Psychedelic Law and Research. It's I think a really important question talking about how can we push forward the boundaries of what we know about psychedelics and mental health and the mind through careful clinical practice and research while also keeping in mind that it does open the door to certain abuses and how do we mitigate those. This is going to be a moderated discussion before we get to that discussion, a few points of housekeeping, the virtual equivalent of where is the bathroom. We strongly encourage you to submit questions at any time during this event. Because this is moderated discussion, we will be drawing upon your questions and posing them to the panelists. How do you submit questions, you may be asking? You can do it using the question and answer feature in Zoom which is found in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that little button that says Q&A, type in a question, send it off. That's the best way to get your question in the queue. We will see it even if it doesn't show for you because Zoom hides it for attendees, but for panelists, we'll all see it. If you don't want to use the Zoom Q&A function, you can join the conversation or submit questions on Twitter at Petrie Flom using the hashtag Poplar. Again, that's hashtag Poplar. We will pull that question, put it into the queue for our moderator to see. If you have any technical issues during the Zoom, please email us at petrie flom at law.harvard.edu and we will try to help you as fast as we can. You may be saying, what a fascinating event I'm about to sit through. I would love to sit through more events on this topic, on other interesting topics involving bioethics, innovation in the medical sciences, health policy, and we'd love to have you. The best way to find out about our events is to sign up for our newsletter, which if you go to our website and scroll down, there's a link to add yourself. The newsletter comes out only twice a month and it includes a roundup of everything that's going on. We also encourage you to read our blog, Bill of Health, which has some really great conversations around cutting edge health policy questions. For example, if you have questions or thoughts about vaccine mandates, the Bill of Health certainly has you covered, as well as just poke around on our site to see what other upcoming events might strike your fancy. Now that I've gone through the logistics, it's my pleasure to introduce your moderator for the event, Mason Marks, who is Assistant Professor of Law at the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law, as well as Senior Fellow and Project Lead of the Project on Psychedelic Law and Regulation at the Petrie Flom Center at Harvard Law School. Mason, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Carmel, and welcome everyone to our panel discussion on ethics in psychedelic therapy and research. This is an event of POPLAR, which is the first academic initiative focused on law and ethics in psychedelics research, therapy, and commerce. And I want to thank Laura Chong, Chloe Reichel, David Angelatos, and the rest of the POPLAR team for making this event possible. This is a very timely discussion for a variety of reasons. We're experiencing a renaissance in psychedelic research and therapy. So these topics are very much in the public consciousness. And this is a pivotal moment for many psychedelic communities to determine their ethics and values. But psychedelics have been around for a very long time. They've been here as long as there has been human civilizations. 
likely much longer. And there are indigenous communities that have used them for hundreds or thousands of years. They have their own practices, their own codes of ethics. There are also longstanding underground psychedelic therapy communities where practitioners administer psychedelics illegally to people to fill an unmet need. Many of the legal mental health therapies we have today are inadequate. They leave many people without symptomatic relief. And so people have offered psychedelics to clients as a means of addressing this need. And of course, new psychedelic communities are forming or growing as various cities and states across the country decriminalize and legalize psychedelics. This discussion on ethics is important because as psychedelics become more accepted in society, we're seeing complaints regarding abuse come to light. One of the benefits of decriminalization, destigmatization, and legalization of psychedelics is that people feel more comfortable reporting misconduct because they may be less likely to be penalized themselves. But as this psychedelic renaissance unfolds, there are still many unanswered questions that we'll address today. So with that introduction, I wanna to turn to our panelists. I'll invite each speaker to take a couple minutes to introduce themselves, provide any relevant background, and perhaps share what they think might be one of the most important ethical issues in this emerging psychedelics landscape. So I wanna turn first to Holly, and uh, then we'll turn to Karen. Holly? Great, um, thank you so much for, um, for hosting uh, this event, Mason. I'm really looking forward to learning um, from the other panelists. My name is Holly Fernandez Lynch. I'm an assistant professor of medical ethics um, and law at the University of Pennsylvania. And my work really focuses on um, research ethics and regulation, as well as FDA policy and pre-approval access to investigational medicines. Um, so those are the lenses um, through which I've been thinking about psychedel psychedelic medicine. Um, personally, I have a close family member who has struggled with PTSD for a very long time um, and has not found any therapeutic relief. So we've been paying close attention to this space um, for, for that reason as well. When I've been thinking about some of the ethical challenges um, that arise in this context, I've often um, thought, how are IRBs, the institutional review boards who are um, going to be responsible for looking at these research protocols, going to decide what projects to allow to proceed or what questions to ask of the investigators as they're starting to get more and more of these protocols um, coming across their desks? Do they have the expertise to evaluate the science, which can be complicated? Um, are they able to make sure that the researchers are engaging with reputable partners and funders? Are, are, are IRBs even the right um, locus of that kind of oversight activity? Um, and how should they be thinking about promoting adequate informed consent with potentially vulnerable research participants um, who may be about to embark on a potentially life-changing experience that could be difficult to understand until you go through it. I think IRBs also will have an important role in figuring out how to tamp down any overhyped claims that might be made um, and that, that might encourage research participants to get their hopes up um, uh, and you know maybe have those hopes dashed. But I also um, recognize that IRBs have a, a reputation for hyper-conservatism, and that could be very problematic um, in, in this space. Um, and then I'll, I'll briefly just mention some of the things that I'm thinking about on the FDA side, which is um, what's the right approach to regulating th these types of therapies? We know FDA um, has relied on enforcement discretion for the most part um, in, in the context of medical marijuana. Um, they do not seem to be keen um, on doing that in the psychedelic space. Um, but there are important challenges about developing evidence that would allow FDA to approve these products um, if we think about, you know, randomized placebo-controlled trials that FDA is used to. So those are some of the things that are on my mind and that I'm looking forward to chatting with everyone else about today. Thanks, Holly. We'll go next to Corinne and then uh, to Alyssa. Hello, and um, thank you very much for this invitation. And I am in gratitude to have this topic coming forward, Mason. Uh, I really hope this is the beginning of many discussions on this topic. Um, 
Currently, I am a research associate at the um, Social Neuroscience and Psychotherapy Lab at OHSU in Portland, Oregon. Um, our clinic is also known as the SNAP Lab. <laughs> um, our team are the first, um, excuse me, <clears throat> our team um, will be conducting the first group trials with MDMA for PTSD with vets. And currently we're writing the protocols for that. And included in the writing that, those protocols, we're including um, a design of the optimum therapeutic space. Satan's set and setting has always been an element. We're also addressing and on the integration side, we're getting, we're getting some interference from your. Now, to maybe try one more time. Are you hearing? Can you hear me? That's better. That's better. Yeah, perfect. Sorry, I have no oh, idea. Oh no, it's fine. Um, so to back up, I don't know where you missed, but um, we're conducting. Um, MDMA group trials for uh, PTSD uh, with VETS. We're going to be including the elements of creating the therapeutic space, as well as uh, the criteria for music. And on the integration side, how do we work with the families and those um, participants going back into the communities that they're they're working on. That's going to be a new direction for us. Um, my uh, background has been as a, a business entrepreneur in many different levels. For, and for 35 years, I've been conducting workshops in the US, India, and in Europe on transformational practices that include experiential work, lectures, creative processes. I'm also a facilitator trainer with MAPS, um, creating and uh, directing their experiential program for therapists who are in the training program. One of my key mentors um, with this work for decades has been Stanislav Grof, the Czech psychiatrist, who uh, was very instrumental in some of the first research, uh, Bethesda, Maryland in the 60s and 70s, using LSD with over 3,000 psychiatric patients. And based on that work, he developed protocols for working with people in non-ordinary states. When it became illegal, became holotropic breath work. But um, his work is really infused in the MAPS training as well as CIIS. Um, so for myself, um, looking at this and being involved with working with thousands of people over 35 years in non-honorary states of consciousness, um, trying to bring it down to one point, I would say education, education, education. And I think education is more important than policies or laws. Um, and I'm going to give it two tracks, the education for the practitioners, the therapists, the researchers, and education for the public. Um, uh, the questions are, who has that qualified information? How do we disseminate it? Who funds it? And um, for me, precise language, having a precise common language as we roll this out in, from the research sector is really important. There's been so much damage uh, using words like psychedelics and drugs that are just so in our uh, language about this that I think have been very damaging and limiting. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alyssa? Thanks for inviting me to be here today, Mason. I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation and echo other sentiments about the timeliness of this conversation. Um, it just keeps getting more timely, it feels, as each day goes on with new news articles and press releases related to these topics. Um, so my name's Dr. Alyssa Bazinet, and I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in Portland, Oregon. I have a background in basic neuroscience research, studying the impact of prolonged substance use on the brain and behavior, and was previously a clinician in the veterans hospital system for 10 years, providing assessment and treatment for veterans with histories of PTSD, substance dependence, and neuropsychiatric conditions. 
And for the past five years, I've been involved in the emerging field of psychedelic therapy. Um, I've operated a private practice providing harm reduction and integration therapy and support for individuals who've had challenging or significant psychedelic experiences in recreational underground or spiritual contexts. So not providing the psychedelics myself, but more on the harm reduction and preparation and integration of folks that are getting those experiences elsewhere. Um, I've also been a lead volunteer for the past five years for psychedelic peer support and harm reduction organizations at festivals and events, um, namely the Zendo Project. I'm trained as an MDMA-assisted psychotherapist for PTSD through MAPS and also in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. And I'm also involved in local advocacy and drug decriminalization efforts in Portland and currently sit on the training subcommittee of the Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board. Um, so something that's feeling really pertinent to me, I'll echo what Karin said, um, is education and this discrepancy between the growing, ever-growing public hype of psychedelic therapy and research, uh, specifically for treating severe mental illness, and then access to accurate information and available services for folks from those populations. I think there's a lot of confusion in the public about terminology, uh, the difference between terms like psychedelic therapy, psychedelic guiding, integration. In Oregon, we're calling it psilocybin surfaces, services, which is not therapy. Um, and it's not always clear what these subtle distinctions are to the public. And I feel that potential consumers don't always know what to look for. So I think that one of the most important ethical issues of the moment is the need to ensure that clients are receiving accurate information on the risks, benefits, and existing research, um, and they have an opportunity to ask questions and fully consent to services. There's also been a lot of overgeneralization of research results in corporate marketing and political campaigns for legalization and decriminalization. And I worry that's leading to unrealistic expectations. Um, when I first came out publicly in my professional role as a supporter of psychedelic therapy, I would get several emails a day from clients who were seeking access to psychedelics. Um, and these were really heart-wrenching. I had to take my contact information uh, off the internet because I would get these emails with folks telling their life stories and talking about um, all of the different interventions they had tried and, and noting that psychedelics were their last hope. And so it's been really challenging um, to, to, to know that that need is out there and we're not yet able to meet that need. Um, and so I worry there's a lot of people out there that perceive this as a cure and don't fully understand what's involved and that it's not always a quick fix or a panacea. Um, I guess the other just really quickly thing that's up for me is there does seem to be an overemphasis on the pharmacological effect of psychedelics in the clinical trials. Um, and just want to note that the psychotherapeutic component is equally important and that this is really a combination oftentimes of um, psychedelic medicine and a therapeutic intervention and the relationship between the client and the therapist being really, really important. And so uh, with more research, we can manipulate those variables and see what those impacts are. But I know that right now, in terms of the FDA, it's really focused on the, um, the pharmacological effects. So that's my, my spiel. And yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Will? Um, hi, everyone. I want to echo the, the thanks for being at this great setting and, and thank you, Mason, and Peter for putting it on. Um, I'm a philosopher, a bioethicist, and a psychiatrist uh, at Penn, a fourth year resident on their research track in the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, clinically, I work mostly with serious mental illness, by which I roughly mean something like more severe cases of treatment resistant depression, bipolar disorder, and primary psychotic disorders. Uh, on the research end, I work in the ethics policy and implementation science, mostly in psychiatry and mostly with those issues, but I've also done a bit of work on psychedelics, particularly informed consent to it, and uh, legalization issues with Dom Sisti and Paul Applebaum. Um, regarding issues of importance, I, I think I mostly want to like echo everything that Alyssa just mentioned in terms of sort of like expectations, perceptions, vagueness of language. Um, and clarifying a lot of those matters. Um, I think Mason's identified a lot of great things that we're about to talk about today. The, maybe one that, that we might add that dawned on me this morning that I've been thinking about a bit is sort of, there's a lot of talk about the quote unquote medical model versus quote unquote non-medical models. And I'll confess to probably not having helped <laughs> um, reduce that kind of talk. 
But uh, I think that, that those things can mean a lot of things. And I think that can lead to some of this sort of confusion. And um, it can confuse not only the public, but it can also confuse policy discussions because people have very different reference in mind when they're talking about these things. Um, so I think some of that could be clarified and uh, as we're sort of working through our policy decision. Great, thanks so much. So we already have one question I just want to address quickly from the um, audience, and that is how long is the therapy, the typical therapy regime? Is it weeks, months, years? Does it depend on the patient? And my understanding is that a lot of these clinical trials are on a time scale of weeks to months. So they're often like a six week period. Um, but I think the interesting thing about psychedelics is that people often report benefits or effects that last for months, sometimes six months or longer. That's not always the case though. Some people um, don't have much of a benefit or they don't have the, such sustained benefits. So I think it is highly variable. Um, would, would everyone agree with that? Sort of on the, it's usually, the treatment's usually on a scale of a, a weeks to months. So the first um, question I wanna address is to, is to focus in on the uh, research setting and what are some of the ethical issues in the context of research? Of course, acknowledging that there are different types of research. There are clinical trials, which typically come to mind. There might also be population-based uh, research or surveys that's done uh, on more informal use of psychedelics. But what are some of the, the uh, concerns or ethical issues that, that come to the surface? I'm happy to, to jump in on, on this one to kick it off. Um, one thing that I often think of in bioethics and research ethics in particular is to make sure that we're not over exceptionalizing things and suggesting that we need like a whole new model and a whole new framework. Um, there may be unique uh, issues that come up in the context of psychedelic research, but a lot of the issues that come up are familiar in research ethics. And so it's just kind of coming up in a different context. Um, so, you know, traditional pharmaceutical research, the way we evaluate it is we basically look at the risks and the benefits, right, both to the research participants and to, um, you know, the populations who are intended ultimately to be helped. And we look and make sure that the science is high quality and that we are not cherry picking research participants and that we have the right kind of inclusion and exclusion criteria, both to minimize risk, but also to make sure that the results will be um, generalizable across populations. Relations. We make sure we're minimizing conflicts of interest and we're promoting adequate informed consent. And all of those things need to happen in the context of psychedelic research. Um, and then there are issues that come up and raise challenges in psychiatric research more generally, right? Making sure that we're carefully monitoring people um, and giving them the right type of support um, that they might need and that we have the right types of supports around informed consent. Um, you know, something that, that Dr. Bazinet had mentioned um, with, with regard to the desperation of some patients in, in these populations um, that can raise challenges about making sure they understand what they're getting themselves into and that they have realistic expectations because they may not have any good treatment options outside of the research setting. So helping them to understand the reason they're in research and why they might be randomized to different doses or perhaps to a placebo is because the whole point of the research is to gain generalizable knowledge. If they benefit, that's wonderful, but that's not the purpose um, of the research. Um, and then, you know, we also see broader research ethics questions about making sure that we're not over protecting people by excluding them um, from research. Um, we have to make sure that we're not assuming that people who might benefit from these interventions are unable to make autonomous choices, right? Um, they may have certain vulnerabilities, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're incompetent to consent to research participation. Um, so the, the, the things that I think maybe are very heightened in this context are who are the research partners and what are their interests? So I think we have a lot of players in this space who um, aren't familiar necessarily with re the research setting, with research ethics, with getting products through the FDA um, pathway. And so making sure that the people you're working with are reputable um, and, you know, thinking about what their financial interests might be. Um, and then thinking about these big picture issues related to study design, blinding, um, use of placebo and those types of things. So I'll, I'll stop by saying um, I have been kind of watching this theme of small little studies popping up all over the place 
Um, and it would be great to see more collaboration um, with larger um, populations of individuals being enrolled in a single study to maybe get some, um, some stronger results. And that might also require some prioritization within the field of what are the most important questions to answer first, second, and third, um, rather than everyone kind of having their own pop-up shop um, in the research side. There are a couple threads that you just um, brought up I kind of want to uh, delve into a little more deeply. One of them is the idea of over-exclusion. Traditionally, there are certain populations that have been excluded from research. These are uh, communities like people with schizophrenia, bipolar, perhaps uh, personality disorders. Uh, there, is a, there is a general narrative that you will often encounter that these communities should be excluded either from the research or from the um, uh, psilocybin services, for example, in the context of, of Oregon. Um, what but, but uh, it seems to me that um, there's not necessarily uh, firm evidence for their exclusion. I've read some narrative reports of people with some of these conditions actually finding it beneficial. What ethical obligation, I guess one question is, what ethical obligation does the research community have to explore the use of these substances in these populations that may or may not be higher risk? So that's one question and then another is this idea of exceptionalism that you mentioned. Um, Karin mentioned um, Stan Groff, who has this great quote that psychedelics may be for neuroscience and psychiatry what the microscope was to biology or the telescope was for, psych uh, for uh, astronomy. Um, so um, if that's true, potentially, and if, could this, if psychedelics could potentially rep represent a new paradigm for research, um, you know, do we have an obligation to treat them differently? Are they unlike perhaps some um, other therapies that don't have this uh, um, larger potential? I guess I can follow up on the first thread there that you just identified, Mason, and, and that was running through my head as, as Holly was talking as well. Um, I think priority setting, which is a standard sort of research ethics type question, uh, standard bioethics and policy question as well, is one of the most pressing things that we might need to think about right now, and particularly uh, setting priority to uh, come up with studies that are going to reflect what our actual populations that we hope to implement this uh, in the real world look like. And the trials have been highly, um, they've had quite high exclusionary criteria uh, thus far, because they're kind of relatively early phase, um, at least when we talk about the serotonergics. When we talk about MDMA, I think we're talking about something different. Um, so when I'm in TRD clinic, my guess, and I, I've been digging, I haven't found good data to generalize, but my guess is probably 15% of the patients in that clinic are actually previously undiagnosed bipolar disorder. So if we have a treatment that's supposed to, one of the big, you know, the big wins would be, uh, succeeding in treatment-resistant depression at a level comparable to ECT, then excluding 10 to 15 percent of that population who frequently is unaware of the fact that they might have an undiagnosed illness, uh, that they've been excluded from the trials because we think they're at risk, seems to me uh, not a good idea. Um, now, there's lots of research que ethics questions about how do you conduct the, uh, the trials to achieve safety, to prove safety? Um, are we talking about challenge studies? Are we talking about early phase one with high-risk populations? I think those are all very interesting questions. Um, I'd say also, uh, in addition to bipolar disorder, the same thing could be said for psychotic spectrum illness. So um, underappreciated is that depression is sort of a core component of schizophrenia. Um, it's a core, and it's a core component that tends to be exceptionally hard to treat. Um, so a lot of the people, when we think about the people who are most severely depressed, are in fact the people we've been excluding from these trials. And I think those are the people who, when we go live in the community and implement it, are likely to end up coming to seek it because they need help and our treatments for them aren't as good. Also using um, Stan Groff's model um, and the, the, the point about creating precise language. Um, he uses a model of a spiritual emergency, a spiritual emergence. And um, 
if a person say is um, organically schizophrenic versus are they um, manifesting these symptoms, but there's something else going on. And what that requires is um, a training and an understanding um, by the therapist to be able to tease out these differences and then how do we work with them? And our current model is, you know, on the clock by the hour. And so we do not have a model for working with people that require more support on an ongoing basis. Um, it, uh, that might look like optimally, we tried this in the 80s, having um, clinics that were residential for people so that they would have 24 hour care in this model. Um, so those are some of the, um, the challenges of looking at this in a very different way. Let me just add a couple more details and I'll go to, I'll go to you, Alyssa. Um, but I just wanna to touch on a couple of things that you both just brought up. Um, and Holly also mentioned uh, um, the size of research. So I wanna bring in, um, we, we just saw one of the largest trials of psilocybin, the reports, uh, the results were reported by Compass Pathways uh, I think about, about 230 uh, participants. And um, someone mentioned a re reporting of results. And I think there was a little bit of confusion and controversy in, in how the results were reported. Um, the company reported it as, as a, a huge success, very positive results, which I think um, in many ways is an accurate interpretation. But there were also some adverse effects. Um, and I read a report last night that it wasn't clear um, how the psychotherapeutic part, uh, the, the, the exact nature of it, uh, what, what exact, what, what kind of psychological support did the participants uh, receive? Kind of getting to your point, uh, Karen, about, um, you know, uh, the, the role of the, the therapy as, as aside from the, the drug. So I guess the question I'm getting at is, um, what are some of the ethical issues involved in, um, accurately reporting research results and the role of the therapeutic process in the research. And I'll go to you, Alyssa, and feel free to comment on that or anything else. There are a lot of questions in, in all of that, but I will uh, speak to a couple points that you mentioned previously and maybe the one that you just mentioned as well, um, which is the role of integration, um, which is a term often used for the therapy that takes place in the protocol that is outside of the use of the psychedelic. So there's a psychedelic assisted session where the client, you know, sits for six to eight hours with a therapist and takes the psychedelic. Um, and often those sessions are, are, are not as interactive or actively processing of psychological material. And then there are integration sessions that take place in the weeks following where the client has the chance to process what came up during the psychedelic assisted session. And oftentimes that's where the adverse event um, can occur because the, the psychedelic can act as a catalyst to opening up somebody's deeper process, uh, repressed trauma or other material that they're not conscious of. Um, and so that can lead to increased suicidality um, or mania or other sorts of presentations that are related to this new awareness of a deeper process. And so that's what Karin was speaking to, the importance of folks um, having that ongoing support. And I think in the clinical trials, you know, there's a, a varied lengths of integration. Um, I think in the psilocybin compass trials, it's maybe two or three, but I could be wrong, um, integration sessions after the medicine session. Um, it's, and I think it's really, really important that we evaluate what the role of that ongoing integration is. Um, and I think that in the Compass results, it was mentioned that the adverse events happened 62 days or something like that was the average amount of time after the psychedelic assisted session. So to me, that is further evidence that things came up afterwards. That's really about a psychological process and not about an acute pharmacological impact of the psychedelic. Yeah, and to just touch on what you said about adverse, again, it's, it's language because um, we used to say that, you know, people have a bad trip. Well, then we say there are no bad trips. There can be difficult trips. So is adverse meaning that they have been able to access this core trauma now um, that has uncovered something that is going to be foundational to the integration of a real 
healing. So we have to really tease out what is adverse because it's a longitudinal process. Thank you for pointing that out. I think it's very interesting to think about how we use language to describe this, um, this space and how that could be potentially harmful or misleading or stigmatizing. Um, let's switch um, to the therapeutic context. And, and what are some of the uh, ethical issues in a therapy context that might differ from research? We had a, a question from an audience member, Zev Nathan, asking us to address uh, issues of boundary violations, which of course have been reported in the research context as well. Uh, and that can happen in both the, um, the legal context, like, like Oregon's system that's being established, as well as in the underground therapy community. And, and we've seen a recent news reports that have focused on allegations of uh, violations of boundaries between a, a facilitator and a client. So what are some of the ethical concerns there and how might we move forward to um, reduce the likelihood? I can start uh, by answering some of that. Yeah, so this is a huge, huge issue um, that um, has received a lot of recent attention. And I think it's a really, really important one. Um, and that is that um, boundaries can be blurred between a therapist and client in a or non-ordinary state of consciousness, um, which can lead to sometimes feeling as if, you know, the client and therapist are um, friends or have, you know, or love between one another, which is true and present, um, but it's different than a traditional talk therapy context. Um, and also psychedelic assisted therapy often involves an element of touch, which in normal talk therapy um, is not as common. And so um, things like holding the client's hand or other forms of touch can be a really integral part of their healing, but that can lead to confusion. Um, and this is because, you know, transference and countertransference are heightened, as well as power differentials. And so it's really important for therapists to be aware of their own response in the session um, and being able to manage their countertransference and reactions they may have towards the client. And um, I think when that is not being done regularly, when clients, I mean, when therapists are not regularly practicing, boundary violations can occur more frequently. Yeah, and again, education, both for the therapist to really understand um, the effect of these medicines of, of dropping these boundaries and to have therapists or researchers that have not had the experiential perspective of this medicine um, may leave them without the total understanding of the vulnerability um, that comes with this work. And also in the preparation, again, education for the participants, the preparation for them to understand the qualities of this medicine and how that potentially makes them vulnerable to this, um, as well as um, understanding the healing potential of touch in a therapeutic sense. So we need more education about how to touch, how to use touch in a non ordinary state of consciousness for healing. And uh, therapists really need that training. And it's very specific. I'm not talking about Hakomi or massage therapy, very specific and different. And um, that has not really been into um, the training in an organized way. It is something that um, Groff's model um, developed um, when they were working with people. It seems like touch is uh, a, a part of um, the more uh, underground grassroots kind of uh, psychedelic communities um, where, where something like a hug might be accepted uh, and, and might even be important because you have to acknowledge that people might be going through a very challenging uh, experience or feeling isolated. How can we integrate that with traditional psychiatry and psychology where a hug might be seen as completely inappropriate? I remember doing, when I did my psychiatry rotation, a patient hugged a provider and it was like an international incident, an incident report had to be written up, you know, for what was really probably um, 
potentially very something very benign. But how how did how can we how can we bring these two things together? And is there a risk that someone might need that reassuring touch of some kind? It might actually be cruel or unethical to withhold it from them um, during that experience. Yeah. Again, the education and it's you know it's a real paradigm shift for the. Um, therapeutic community. Um, I'll, I'll give an example of working with a, a, a psychiatrist who um, had an attachment disorder and he found that he, and we were in an honorary state, he found that he'd been in an incubator, um, you know, 40 years ago and had not had therapeutic touch or had not had that nurturing touch. And so in a non ori state of consciousness, it was a repair, a very deep repair for him to have touch when he was regressed in the right place. Um, that's an example of when it can be profoundly um, healing, but it can also be damaging and there need to be agreements between the participant and the provider um, at all steps along the way so that the participant is the person that is in control, you know, feels that they are in control. So they're not re-traumatized. I'll just, um, you know, underscore that. I mean, I think part of the, part of what can happen on the education side is helping the patient recognize what is to be expected. And that helps them understand this is, this was not expected. Maybe this is a boundary violation. Maybe I should talk to somebody about what is, is happening, right? Um, you know, outside of this context, right, in, in other abuse contexts, you often hear people say, I thought it was normal. I was told it was normal. I didn't think to, to share my experience with anyone. And only in talking with others, they realized that it was, it was a, you know, very significant boundary violation that, that has happened. And so having some kind of objective, independent source of information to say, here's what you can expect, um, here's what you might want to talk about in advance and agree to, um, and here's what would be kind of really beyond the pale, abnormal, um, inappropriate behaviors. I also want to support the, the, the therapist needs support because of the potential liability issues as well, the projections, the transfers, you know, um, um, one way to do that is to never be alone with someone um, in a non-ordinary state of, of, of consciousness and not to be touching when we're alone in a room with someone. You know, there, there need to be ways for um, the providers to be uh, safe as well from the potential um, accusations and the, the, the misconstruing of a therapeutic touch as well um, is, is really dangerous for anyone who is in that position of, of offering that. Will, did you want to jump in? I, I think it, I think I think it's been mentioned so. Alyssa, did you want to comment? I was just going to add one comment to Karen's last statement about um, why there's often two therapists in the room to the one client. Most of the FDA trials and and underground work um, operates that way as well to have two therapists in the room. I guess, I guess maybe I changed my mind. Uh, it, it does strike me, at least anecdotally, and I don't know how much great data we have, that there is a lot of variability in underground work. So I think it's one of the difficulties moving forward is that there are different standards in different communities practice, and um, what can be expected kind of depends on where you are and who you're talking to in some ways. So one of the struggles I think in standardization is going to be coming to come some sort of consensus about that. I think Matt's has done a lot of great work here. I think various people have done a lot of great work, but I think there's likely to be a little bit of rub as that solidifies or not. Yeah, and for the for the public, I mean, I look at it like it's going to take a generation. We don't have a code for um, participants about respect and safety for um, you know, utilizing these psychoactive substances. And I think it's gonna be a long-term process um, to educate and create this code or these, uh, standardize this. One of the things we're working on in Oregon is a a client bill of rights and a facilitator code of conduct, which is which are very challenging to put together, but we're, we're making our best attempt. 
I want to turn to another question from the audience. This is from Beth Wang. Beth asks, would you all like to see FDA be more accepting of real world evidence for psychedelics? Or are there other types of evidence and trial designs that you think would work best for demonstrating safety and efficacy? I, I find this to be a very partic uh, particularly interesting question because I've thought a lot about how uh, anecdotal evidence can be used to prohibit a substance. That's often how substances like psychedelics become placed in schedule one of the controlled substances list. So they, um, the DEA will accept anecdotal evidence, but anecdotal evidence is not accepted to um, deschedule a substance or um, to gain FDA approval, although there is a movement in the direction of using real world evidence more in the FDA approval process. But I'd like to get your thoughts on that. It makes me nervous, I have to say. I don't, now, so the second part of the question, like what other types of evidence or types of trial designs would be better, I'm more stuck on. But real world evidence um, is something that's got a lot of hype around it. Um, it's something that policymakers are really enamored of, um, telling FDA to, to focus more on real world evidence, um, including proposals for accelerated approval products to um, be allowed to rely on real world evidence for their confirmatory um, studies. But then there's also been, you know, some, some recent analyses um, on exactly that question, trying to compare the information that would be available through real, real world evidence with trial information and they they don't add up, they don't match, right? So as of now, we have not figured out how real world evidence can really substitute for well-designed clinical trial data in other pharmaceutical contexts. This is a very difficult situation because you 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 know you you can't really use an inert placebo, right? You'll have the expectation effects associated with that. Um, so do you then just test different doses and compare them. Um, I think it's a, it's a huge challenge for the field to figure out what kind of evidence will be um, and will be legitimately convincing. Um, I think default to real world evidence would be a disservice to the field. Um, it's, a, it's a much weaker standard. And I think it, it may ultimately um, be kind of a shrug, like, <laughs> Maybe it works, maybe maybe it doesn't, and I think we owe it to these patients to really figure out what is going to be beneficial, um, because there are side effects, um, and there will be expenses associated with these things, both financially and in terms of potentially staying on something that isn't helping, um, you know, rather than pursuing other other alternatives. So it makes me nervous, but I don't yet have a, a better option. Um, I guess I just wanted to add uh, part of it's too on, hangs on what we call real world, right? So pragmatic design trials are very different than like anecdotal evidence from anywhere, right? And so there's questions about the trial designs that should be appropriate and whether placebo is fitting, which FDA usually requires versus questions about like, how do we get something that implementation wise is robust? Um, I think also uh, like, you know, sort of echoing something Holly was just alluding to and maybe taking it to the psychiatric space, like the history of psychiatry for the past 50 years could arguably put as we thought this was going to work and it didn't, repeated over and over and over again. And so um, the, the problem that Holly was just bringing up in psychiatry of me seeing someone, anybody else seeing someone and me being like, I think it's helping you a little bit versus is this just pure like naturalistic history unfolding versus are you getting a shrug better or whatnot is is a common problem with what with everything we have right now with robust trials it gets all the worse when you decrease the trial threshold um of course though like dosage questions and appropriate trial design as as we've both mentioned a second ago is a tricky subject with something where there's potentially a large psychological unfolding component as we've been talking about. I, I should add that it, it seems to me the FDA is moving away in many respects from clinical trials. So moving in the direction of real world evidence. And then a, a direction I'm interested in is increasing reliance of the FDA on uh, simulations using computer models that have nothing to do with um, actual clinical trials. 
And so um, we may be seeing an evolution away from the clinical trial in, in many ways. But I want to turn to the non-FDA approval pathway. Obviously, establishing the safety and efficacy of therapies is very important, but we're seeing uh, a different, different paths emerge. Uh, about a dozen U.S. cities have decriminalized psychedelics. The state of Oregon decriminalized virtually all drugs and has legalized a supported psilocybin administration, uh, as Alyssa pointed out, it's called um, psilocybin services. What are the ethics involved in decriminalization and legalization? Uh, you know, I just read an article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal. We saw a record number of drug overdose deaths, over 100,000 in the past year. Uh, there's a need for alternatives to address uh, substance use and, and mental health conditions. Psychedelics appear to have efficacy in those areas. Um, but even if they aren't entirely efficacious, they, they do appear to be particularly safe, uh, especially psilocybin. So um, would it be unethical to withhold them uh, from people through, uh, through this, uh, these other pathways? I'll speak to that a bit. Um, I think that, you know, regards to decriminalization, I think that with the public explosion of interest in these substances, people are going to be using them in increasing numbers anyway. And so to me, it's not about uh, whether we decriminalize or not. It's about providing the harm reduction and education that's needed to respond to that increased interest and increased use. And I think that will happen regardless of whether we decriminalize or not, um, at least in Oregon. And I know that I live in a bubble here and I'm not really sure how the rest of the country operates. And I think it might be pretty different, um, but it feels like an ethical obligation for us to be providing harm reduction information and services to folks, regardless of the legality of these substances. Uh, I totally agree. And my concern about being involved on a committee that's been, in, been um, um, pushing more decriminalization here in the state of Oregon is um, my own personal ticker with my ethics about the responsibility to educate the public. Here we are, you know, pushing this stuff to come out, and yet it's an over, oversimplification of very complex issues and processes that have the potential for healing. And we're not using the, the language um, th that is required. And we don't even have a mechanism to educate the public. Like who is going to be qualified? Who's going to fund this? What distribution channels are we going to use to get this information out? We're not allowed to talk about it in the schools. I mean, it's right up there taboo with sex to talk about in the schools. There's no motivation for funding. You know, it's kind of going to be a buyer beware in that way. And, um, you know, the top things for me for um, the, the end users, I'm something from Arrowhead um, and Think of Arrowwood, um, it's E-R-O-W-I-D. Um, it's a website that's been around for a long time. It is a deposit for a lot of things re relating to this. Um, think of it as a library actually. And one of their um, terms from the, the underground that we used many, many years ago and is still being used is, for the end user is for education is know your body, know your mind, know your substance and know your source. And those are the keys that need to be um, taught in our community today. Um, and the biggest impediment to that is that the end user does not have a way to really know in a safe way what the substance is because um, the 1974 DEA uh, regulation does not allow us when we send something into a lab, there are only two labs where the public can test and the DEA does not allow that information specifically about what the dose is to come back to the person. So the DEA controls that, but the person does not. So um, I think that 1970 
for DEA regulation is the number one impediment for safety for um, the public it needs to be changed. Let me let me add, you know, I generally speaking, I'm, I'm all for, you know, getting law enforcement out of people's lives. Um, you know, there there are potentially, um, you know, I think as Corinne was just mentioning, you know, other types of regular regulatory oversight that could help um, on the safety side of things. The concern that I have about um, these different pathways, right? So one approach would be kind of decriminalize, legalize. The other approach would be the more kind of medical model of let's figure out what works. Let's go through the FDA pathway. We'll market it. We'll get insurance reimbursement for it. Um, there's pros and cons to both of those um, approaches. My worry about not going the FDA pathway um, is that we could then be left in this situation where we're not really sure how therapeutically beneficial these things are, um, because there will be much less reason to participate in a study. Um, there'll be much less reason to, to research it. Um, and then even if there are therapeutic benefits of these um, interventions, people will be left to pay for them out of pocket. Now, obviously, insurance coverage is going to be a whole other challenge. There's lots of inequities um, in insurance coverage as well. Um, but I, I worry about um, this you know, paying for it yourself mechanism, um, heightening inequities. I guess I'll just add that I think it's, this might be one of those spaces where I think there's lots of varying pathways within the pathways that we kind of all vaguely have in mind here. So uh, for many of the reasons Holly was just mentioning, I think um, there are reasons that we want to affect the markets that are going to unfold and already unfold, uh, whether legitimated markets by the law or not. Um, and I think it's uh, maybe the best way to put it is like, right, like, so Douglas Husak is probably the person who I think of when I think of decriminalization as being like the clearest writer on it. And he basically says that everybody means something different by it, right? So... Legalization, likewise, depending upon what you're legalizing, varies. So I think when we're thinking about the pathways that we're unfolding, it's, it's important to be really kind of clear about which direction we're going and which things we have in mind so that we have a sense of how the policy is going to unfold and how the markets are going to put pressures, whether social or monetary, on people, users, and providers to take certain routes that may or may not be in somebody's interest. Any other thoughts on whether these pathways can coexist? I mean, is there any reason why we can't have um, FDA approval and decriminalization and legalization um, like we have in Oregon? And I, I regret that we're running low on time and this is probably the last um, topic that we'll be able to address today. We've barely scratched the surface, but any thoughts on coexistence of these different approaches? I think that's what we're aiming for in Oregon, right? And we'll see how it all pans out, but it's been a really exciting challenge to think about um, how we can maybe try to do everything. <laughs> um, we have decriminalization of everything, um, of all substances. We have uh, legalization of psilocybin services, which again is outside the FDA model, outside the medical model. So I think there's some challenges there as well, just in terms of, you know, who is appropriate for services and how do we determine that and um, how do facilitators need to be trained. Um, they don't need to have a background in mental health. They don't need to be licensed as a mental health professional. So how do we train providers in this new uh, service that we're offering? Um, and it feels like a grand experiment, but I'm hoping, I'm hopeful that we can figure it out. It feels as we wrap up, uh, Thank you. These are, that was a powerful statement, Alyssa, and uh, I think it's a good point to leave that discussion. And as we wrap up, I just want to invite each of you to give sort of a tweet length statement, just a couple sentences on um, what you think is most important moving forward from an ethics standpoint as we see this, this landscape unfold. I'll start. Um... I think it's really um, important to build on ethical frameworks that we already have so that we aren't reinventing the wheel where we don't need to. That's probably all I could tweet, right? That's very short. That was perfect. <laughs> I, 
I guess I can chime in. Um, I think it's important that we make sure that um, our promising treatments are going to be available to those most in need and that they're most effective for those most in need. Okay, I'll try this out. I'm not a tweeter, so feel free to edit it. <laughs> um, I'm going to focus on the importance of the practitioners in this space committing to doing their ongoing inner work um, and ongoing awareness of how um, they show up in the space with clients and how that impacts the energy in the room and potential yeah, I'm, I'm rambling on. Maybe you can get a tweet out of that, but trying to make a tweet statement is a challenge for me. That would have been an outstanding tweet. Yes, for me, it's education and accurate knowledge and that people, be they therapists or the participants, um, really need to be trained how to um, seek this uh, accurate information and be in, in, empowered in whatever role that they're playing. Thank you so much. This has really been a privilege and a lot of fun. We barely scratched the surface, as I said. I hope this is a starting point for many more conversations between us. Thank you to all our attendees. Um, if you're interested in more events, please uh, follow us on our website. We're going to have um, an event on psychedelics and trauma on December 8th that we'll be announcing very soon, the details of that and look forward to our uh, future programming in the spring as well. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Have a great Thursday. Take care. Thank you.